Okay, so to that end, let's get started then on um, five Texans, every single Texan needs. Now these documents, I do want to caution you, I think we all know or have heard or have someone has told us or if you've been to any speaking engagement that me or Lisa has presented at, um, we would have told you this before. But a refresher, um, just to kind of remind us of things that we need to have in place, regardless of our age or our marital status, these are documents that we need. Let's talk about the first one, a last will and testament, right? Everyone needs a last will and testament. Even if you've done revocable living trust planning, or you've named beneficiaries on all of your accounts, or you've done other planning where you're trying to avoid probate, um, you still need a last will and testament. Um, because inevitably, we buy a house, or we buy a car, or we open up a new bank account, and we don't name a beneficiary on it, um, and we need to transfer the assets on death, and we'll need a last will and testament to do that. And so the last one testament is a very, very important document because it allows us the maximum flexibility to make sure that the people we want to get our property when we die get our property. All right. Um, if we do not do a last one testament, then there's no guarantee that our heirs are who they think they are. Where I run into uh, situations all the time is I have people come in to see me, especially second marriages. And uh, this wife will say, well, my husband and I've been married 21 years. Um, he bought this house right before we got married. Um, and we both understood I, would, I got the whole house when he died. But that's not the way the law works for heirs and descent and distribution. Um, so to make sure the second wife actually gets that house, we need to make sure we have a last will and testament in place or other documents that we draft that specifically arrange for that. So the last will and testament is very important. It allows us to name the beneficiaries of our estate. It allows us to name the executor of our estate. It allows us to, if we're young and we have minor children, it allows us to designate who would be the guardian of our minor children if something happens to us. It allows us to deal with taxes if we, if we have a taxable estate. It allows us to make powers of appointment. And very, very importantly, it allows us to draft and make testamentary trusts. We do a lot of testamentary trusts in our practice. Um, we have cases all the time where mom and dad come in to see us and mom says, you know, I wanna leave something for my son, but I don't really trust my son's wife. I'm not sure they're gonna stay married. And if they do, she's very bossy and controlling. And I don't want her determining what happens to my money that I leave to my son. And so one way to solve that problem is to leave money to him in trust, allow somebody else to manage that money for his benefit. Um, another very common situation where you need a testamentary trust is a second marriage, right? Um, I often have situations where people say, well, you know, once, once my husband dies, once I die, my wife's going to remarry, and then everything's going to go to her second husband. Well, we can prevent that and protect assets for the children by doing a testamentary trust. Another common situation where a testamentary trust comes into play would be if we want to protect assets for nursing home planning. We often do what we call a contingent special needs or supplemental needs trust as a testamentary trust, which allows the surviving spouse to shield half of the assets when the first spouse dies from potential Medicaid qualification or nursing home bills. So very important to have a will and to consider um, what you want to happen to your property when you die. Next, power of attorney. This refers to a financial power of attorney, what we often call a durable power of attorney. Um, what makes it durable is, is simply that there's a sentence in the document itself that says, if I make this power of attorney and I later lose capacity, then it stays good. I do not want my power of attorney to die and go away just because I've lost capacity. You know, if I had a stroke, a heart attack, um, if I just get dementia of some sort or Alzheimer's as I get older, then I will lose capacity to make decisions for my own business affairs. And if I don't have that language in it making it durable, then technically, legally, my power of attorney dies when I become incapacitated. So we want to make sure that we add that language and make it a durable financial power of attorney. 
And power of attorneys are very flexible. I think a lot of people lose track of the fact of how flexible they are. They can be very, very limited in scope, or they can be very, very broad in scope. Um, occasionally, I, I just recently did a power of attorney for a family where a husband travels a lot and they have a business that the wife runs. And when she needed to be able to sign his name on different business matters while he was gone. And so we did a very limited power of attorney for that purpose only. We do power of attorneys all the time for families and marital couples, and we make them very broad. We add extra powers. And if you look on the slide here, you'll see where down below where it says hot powers. Um, we can add hot powers to a power of attorney that enlarges the power um, that the agent has. Now, we would not want to make a very broad power adding hot powers to a power of attorney unless the agent and the subsequent alternate agent that we choose on our power of attorney are people that we trust like very, very much. Um, people that we trust, I even sometimes like to say 150%, right? Even though that's not possible, but very much trust them that no matter what would happen, they would only take actions that were in our best interest and consistent with our general estate plan. Um, because when we make broad powers, that's what exactly what they mean. They're broad. We give them a lot of ability to sign our name and do things. So, so keep that in mind. Uh, while we're talking about hot powers, I know a lot of times, well, what are those hot powers? Well, it, they, they consist of giving somebody the ability to make a gift, giving somebody ability to change the beneficiary on a bank account or to change the type of bank account you have, giving somebody the ability to create, amend, modify a trust that you have or don't have yet are some of the hot powers. And so if you're going to give an agent the ability to make gifts, you want to make sure they're not going to take all of your money and go to Las Vegas or to Windstar, right? So you need to be very careful with those hot powers. We also need to note that it can be effective immediately or it can be effective at a later date. Um, we usually recommend to make our power of attorneys effective immediately, as long as, again, we feel very good about our agents on our power of attorney. Um, if we make it effective at a later date, like we could say something, this power of attorney becomes effective upon my subsequent disability or my subsequent incapacity. If we do that, our agent has to go and get a doctor's letter um, and keep a current doctor's letter available saying that we're incapacitated. And so we just add a little bit of administrative headache to our agent in the event if we do it that way. But, but sometimes families want to do that. And then that's not necessarily wrong depending on who our agents are on our power of attorney. Um, so keep all of that in mind. And this is a very flexible, but very important power of attorney. One thing I want to add to this discussion about power of attorney is keep in mind that when you name an agent on your power of attorney, they're not in charge of you. You're not giving your agent the ability to make decisions for you um, or to tell you what you have to do with your money. You still own your money. You're still in charge of your money, your house, your car, your estate. Um, you're just giving an extension of power to somebody to help you, especially if you become incapacitated or you were to get injured in a car wreck or a fall or something. Somebody needs to be able to help you. But every now and again, I'll have someone in my office or I'll be somewhere and I'll hear the agent say, I'm the, I'm the power of attorney, I'll make mama do this or mama's gonna do that. And that's not the way it works. Same for medical power of attorney. That's the third document we want everybody to have. Um, just because someone's an agent on your medical power of attorney, they can't make you go to the nursing home. They can't make you get a surgery you don't wanna get. They can't even make you go to the doctor, okay? They have the ability to make medical decisions for you only if the doctor says you're not capable of doing it. The doctor has to certify that in writing. And once the doctor certifies in writing that you're not capable of making a decision regarding your medical care, then your agent's entitled to make it for you. But if you resist or disagree, they still can't make you engage in that medical decision that they choose for you. And at that point, they're forced into getting a guardianship if that, if that were to occur. Um, directive to physician. This is another document we want everybody to have. Um, this says that, um, especially if you're 60 and over, um, 
this says that, you know, if I, you know, they're not going to be able to survive without life sustaining procedures because of an irreversible condition or a terminal condition, then I want the doctor to let me go, right? Don't use life sustaining measures to keep me alive if I'm otherwise terminal and going to die anyways. Um, it does usually state I want, you know, some comfort care. Um, give me some morphine, give me some ibuprofen if that will work, if not something strong like morphine, and make me comfortable. But don't keep me alive if I'm not going to survive on my own anyways. So that's a very important document. Now, one thing to note about this directive to physician that most people don't know is that it can also say the opposite. It can say, I direct my physician to take any and every step necessary to keep me alive, period. I direct my physician to use a ventilator, to use a feeding tube, to use any and all experimental procedures that are reasonably available to keep me alive. Um, you can certainly do your directive and you can give that instruction. So keep that in mind as well. But I will tell you the traditional and normal use of the directive to physician is, is to say you want to go when the time comes. And this is a very important document because I often get questions about, well, if I have a medical power of attorney, do I still need a directive to physician? Can't my agent make that decision for me at the time? Yes, your agent and the medical power of attorney can make the decision to pull the plug, even if you haven't done a directive to physician. But I will tell you, it is very helpful to your agent and to your doctor if you have prepared this document in advance saying you wanna go. Because when you're in the hospital and you're on a feeding tube or on a ventilator or they're using life-sustaining measures to keep you alive, it's very, very difficult for your spouse or your children to just make that decision on their own at that moment. Um, they're forced into making a decision that says, yes, take, take my spouse, take my wife or my husband um, or my dad or my mom away. Go ahead, just do it. Um, and it, it is a little bit easier to make that call if they know that while you were healthy, mentally alert, you prepared a directive to physician that said, when the time comes, pull the plug. It just makes it so much easier. Next, the HIPAA release. It surprises me how much a HIPAA release is overlooked by people and other lawyers when they do estate planning. This is very important. It does not give anybody the ability to make any kind of decision for you or to take any action for you but it does give them authorization to find out information about you, uh, medical information about you. And that's really important, especially like you can see why right now in a, in a case, if we were to get COVID-19, the coronavirus, um, we would be in the hospital, we would be sequestered away from any family visitation and our family would not be allowed to come into the hospital, come see us, all of their communication with the doctors or nurses is gonna be by a video camera, and it's gonna be very limited. And it's gonna be even more limited if we hadn't done a HIPAA release authorizing medical professionals to talk about us with these individuals. So usually you would wanna list you know, your spouse and all your children, maybe even your parents, um, anybody who you want to be able to access medical information about you. You can limit what kind of information can be learned. I mean you can put in those authorizations, you know, you're welcome to talk about any of my general conditions, uh, but do not disclose any of my psychological records or information. Do not disclose any information related to any illnesses I had more than five years ago. You can certainly customize and do that as well. But this is very important that's often overlooked. All right, those are the five documents that we want every single Texan to have. Every single Texan seems, needs to know about and have, in, regardless of their age, uh, regardless of their marital status. Um, even if you say to me, I don't have much assets, yeah, that's okay. You still need to have these documents in place, all five of them. Now, I wanna visit with you about some other valuable documents, all right? Those five documents are really good foundation and will take care of most of our needs if we, if we draft them with good consideration um, and with help from an attorney. But there are some other valuable documents that might really be suitable to our estate plan um, and help us with our assets while we're alive and after we die. Let's talk about a few of them. One is an out-of-hospital DNR, a do not resuscitate order. 
This I see used in situations where a loved one is in a nursing home, they're bedridden at home and they're terminally sick. Um, I've had a couple of clients that were certainly mobile and still wanted to do an out of hospital DNR, but this is a special form that's, that, that we have to use that's put out by um, the Texas Department of Health. Um, and what it says is, even though I'm not in the hospital, if my heart stops beating, I do not want to be resuscitated. I do not want to be shocked. I don't want CPR. If I drop dead in the middle of HEB, or if I'm at home and I'm bedridden and I'm sick and, I, and my heart stops, do not let the EMT start treating me and trying to bring me back alive. That's what this says. Um, so in order for this document to work, it has to be displayed uh, prominently. So when EMT officials show up or anybody else shows up and sees that you're having cardiac arrest, um, they won't immediately start working on you and trying to bring you back to life. It has to be properly displayed and that you need to have an ID also available and prominently displayed as well. Because if an ER, you know, doctor or an EMT technician shows up and starts to work on you, they're not going to, you know, they're not going to let you sit there or lie in bed or lie on the floor without starting to treat you unless that's readily available. Another document that's very important, designation of guardian. This allows me or any one of you to designate in writing now while we're healthy um, a choice who would we want to be our guardian in the event a judge or a court ever is in the position of appointing a guardian to take care of us, all right? So if I were to get dementia, become combative, and wouldn't allow my doctors to treat me, and I name my wife as my agent on the medical power of attorney, and she still can't get me treatment, um, she might be forced into a position of having to go down and apply for guardianship. And that would be just fine as things are today. But what if I was remarried with a second wife and she went down to get guardianship over me? My two boys might decide that they could do a better job taking care of me than my second wife. And when that happens, it sets up a situation for a conflict. And as a result, the judge is going to have to decide who should be guardian. Now, there are statutes that talk about priorities. There are also disqualification statutes. But ultimately, it's still going to be a conflict. But today, while I'm healthy, I can put in writing, I want my second wife to be my guardian, or I want my oldest or my second child to be my guardian. I can make that decision. I can also say in writing who I do not want to be my guardian. So if I have, say, four children, and I like all of them, but I know one of them is like a spendthrift, likes to gamble, makes bad decisions with money, I might draft a designation of guardian that says, if I ever need a guardianship of the estate, I specifically do not want my child, my son, whoever it might be, to be named as guardian for me because I know that they're not going to do a good job taking care of money. Also, if I know that I have a child or a second wife that isn't capable of doing the job, I might choose to, dis to, to disqualify them in the designation of guardian. This is a particularly important document in blended family cases. Next, designation of an agent for the disposition of remains. Same situation. When I die, let's say that um, I die first and my wife survives me. She remarries. Um, I have two children who also survived me. Um, you know, so when she remarries, then I've been buried, I have a, a burial plot, I have a nice um, headstone that's there where I'm at, um, and then she dies. Is her husband going to bury her next to me? Or is her second husband going to bury her next to his first wife, right? So I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I'm hoping that she doesn't have a second husband, and if she does, she still gets buried next to me, right? But I can choose now who's gonna make that decision. And so I could put in writing that when I die, um, I want my, you know, my son to decide where I'm buried. And then hopefully my wife would also make that same designation of agent, saying that when she dies, she wants our son, one of our sons to make that decision, not her second husband. And hopefully he has instructions to bury us together. So 
I have had numerous cases where people, children, especially stepchildren and surviving spouse were having disagreements about what to do with mom or dad um, after they die, whether or not to have a cremation, whether or not to bury them in certain locations, who can make the funeral arrangements, and this could be a very helpful document to prevent some of that. Next, Ladybird deed. We use ladybirds all the time now. We do it in our estate planning um, and um, for all kinds of documents. So our estate plan um, often includes a ladybird deed. We, it came about originally in 2004, 2005 because the state of Texas Medicaid program um, made a um, new a law that said if somebody gets Medicaid, the state of Texas has to go after their house when they die to get reimbursed. And as a result, um, hold on, let me get this slide back. One second. Uh, all right, here we go. All right, sorry about that. Um, so the state, the uh, Medicaid program, state of Texas came in and said, okay, look, if we paid for your Medicaid for a nursing home, we're gonna take your house, sell it, and pay ourselves back. If something's left over, it can go to the family. Well, when they made this law and this, what we call Medicaid state recovery, when, when they set out these rules, um, there was a loophole left in there that said they can only recover the house if it's part of the probate estate. And so um, attorneys started scouring the law, started scouring the estates code, the property code and say, what kind of way, what, 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 is, what can we do to protect the home and other property um, in the event somebody got Medicaid um, so that we don't lose the house? Well, an enhanced life estate deed is the official term, which we call ladybird deed, um, started coming into play and everybody realized, you know what? We can draft a deed that says, I give my house to my children or to somebody else when I die, uh, but I reserve the right to change my mind. I reserve the right to do something different. So if I want to downsize and move, if I want to uh, you know, just do something completely different with the house, rent it out, I can do whatever I want with my property until I die. If I, if I still own it when I die, then I designate in this ladybird deed who gets it. And the nice thing about that is it transfers automatically ownership the day I die to whoever's named in the ladybird deed. It avoids probate. And so because it avoids probate, it avoids the Medicaid state recovery program. So this is a very powerful tool, um, but you don't, need to have, uh, you don't need to only use it for a Medicaid case. We use it in just traditional state planning a lot. You know, we do it for families a lot, just in case they end up on Medicaid with an, in a nursing home someday, or it's just a nice way to transfer property quickly, efficiently to uh, children when we die. All right, guidance letters. That's another type of document that, that we recommend people to consider. There are different kinds of guidance letters. There's also a memo distributing property with a, that we often recommend people do to attach to a will. So, so kind of two different scenarios where we see these used a lot is one where I say, um, I leave all my property to my two boys when I die. Um, I instruct them to agree on the property, but if they can't, um, then, the, then it'll just be sold and the money split. But I do say in my will, I'm going to attach a memo and I instruct my executor to follow whatever my memo says that's attached to the will with regard to personal property when I die. And then in that memo, I can go through and list, I want my wedding ring to go to one of my kids. I want my shotgun to go to this child. I want different guns to go to different children or to different grandchildren. Um, and mostly this deals just with personal property items. I want the bedroom suit, which has been in our family for the last 150 years, to go to my daughter because she's always wanted it. You know, I put those types of things in the memo. So this is a type of guidance letter that we recommend people to use all the time. Another scenario would be um, if I'm making tricky decisions. Like recently, I worked on a will for a family where they left a different percentage, an unequal percentage to one of their daughters, um, and, and then left a larger percentage to the other two or three children. And so, I, you know, we talked about, well, we need to make some note in the will, or we need to make a note to attach to the will that kind of explains why we did that, because they were very close to that daughter. It wasn't a situation where like, well, 
we've lent her lots of money. She never paid us back and she'll know that. It wasn't something like that. There were just some other reasons. And so we discussed either a guidance letter or some sentences in the will kind of explaining what's going on. Also often, you know, we have family owned businesses and we might leave all the family owned business to the one child who's been working with us forever in it and nothing to the other children. And if that's the case, we might want to explain that because sometimes the other children just assume they're going to inherit and be owners too, even though they've had nothing to do with the family business. There are those types of considerations. Next, um, a revocable trust is a document that I want people to also think about. You know, a revocable trust we often hear about is a family trust, a living trust. If you're uh, watching news magazines like CNBC or um, some other of those types of stations, you'll often see a financial advisor say you have to have a living trust. You've got to have a revocable trust, a family trust. Well, in Texas, you don't have to have such a trust, but you can have a trust. Um, and, and they can be very important. They help us manage our assets while they're alive. They help us manage the assets after we die as well because we put instructions inside the trust what happens to the property after we die. Um, but it is a separate entity and we have to transfer our assets into the revocable trust if we decided to do that. So we just always have to weigh the pros and cons of do we need a trust, will we want a trust, does it make sense under our circumstances? This is a trust that we create while we're alive and we use it while we're alive. Uh, one kind of revocable trust that we use often while we're alive is a special needs trust for children that have disabilities. We often do a third party special needs trust for kids um, in our trust, in our will when we die, but we often create them for families while they're still alive. That way they can put money into that trust now other family members can put money into that trust. Other family members can leave money into that trust when they die in their will through their estate. And so there's, it's a good trust to do while we're still alive. All right. Those are all the documents. I know that we didn't go into a lot of specifics on each document, but it does give you a good overview on the documents that you need to have and that you really want to have as a part of your estate planning and the documents that might be very valuable to your estate